Okay, so uh, once again, I'm Fred Williams. I live here in Prague. I speak at every Agile Prague conference. I introduce speakers, and my reward for introducing the other speakers and being a moderator and coordinating the volunteers is that I can pick any topic I want. So today, I wanted to talk about looking stupid as opposed to being stupid. Um, fortunately, uh, I am an expert in looking stupid. Uh, <laughs> and it's, I believe, the real key to agility is to be comfortable with looking stupid, be comfortable with not having the answers, be comfortable saying, I don't know, but let me ask some questions, right? Uh, the benefits of looking stupid is that you can actually learn. When I first came here many, many years ago, everybody told me that learning the Czech language, uh, especially for an English speaker, is virtually impossible. Nobody does it, right? Um, and I decided that I was going to challenge that, that I was actually going to learn Czech. And I found that the key to learning Czech is that you're going to look stupid a lot. <laughs> so I, I said some amazingly stupid things, right? So I, 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 I figured out that the, the noun for, uh, uh, Excuse me, the, the, the verb for stealing is uh, krat, kradl, right? So naturally, I thought that the noun, uh, what is a person who steals, must be a kradlik. <laughs> so I look stupid. I look stupid. But the thing is, by looking stupid, I actually was practicing the language and making the mistakes so I could be corrected. If you just sit there and listen, and are afraid to talk, you'll never learn a language. Learning a language requires looking stupid. And only smart people are comfortable with looking stupid like that. Uh, the same thing with uh, when I started in the IT industry, right? Uh, I didn't know very much. And so I had to ask a lot of questions. And some people would look at me and say, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, the more comfortable you are with looking stupid, the more you're going to be able to learn. Uh, and now, I'm considered something of a leader in the Agile community. I get invited to speak at a lot of conferences. But really, the only way that I've learned anything about agility is by kind of feeling stupid. When I feel like I'm smart and I know everything, that's when I make the mistakes. It's when I'm asking my really simple questions that I'm able to do good things, like helping out on the Skeptical Agile blog, where I ask some questions, because sometimes we hear people speaking at conferences, and we think, oh, that must be true. But then I ask my stupid questions, and we find out that some of these things, yeah, it sounds good, doesn't actually work that way. So you never want to underestimate the power of human stupidity. Another of my favorite writers, Robert Heinlein, said that. And originally, I thought this quote was about, you know, how stupid people mess everything up. But now I've come to think of this as meaning, don't underestimate the power of looking stupid, right? This is a powerful tool that you can use, looking stupid. Because uh, a lot of highly intelligent people act stupid, right? They engage in belly bumping. Belly bumping was something in the 1980s where you get two really fat guys, and they're like, boom, and they have to bump each other out of a circle. It's like sort of a redneck sumo. <laughs> and, but, but in a lot of IT companies, what have you got? You got these young guys who are like, I'm smarter. No, I'm smarter. Doing this intellectual belly bumping. And it's a waste of time, and it doesn't help us get anything done. So, you know, when I was 18, I was the smartest man on the planet. But now that I'm 52, I've gotten progressively stupider and stupider and stupider, so I'm getting better at this. Um, 
what it all comes back to is a fancy word from the Greeks, epistemology. Epistemology is the question, how do you know what you know? Separating honest belief from mere opinion. How can we evaluate if something is true, if something is actually factual? And uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and many others wrote about this exact topic. So uh, when it comes to books I would recommend, I would recommend going back to some of those classics too and asking how do we know what we know? Because so many times, right, we see vaporware or we, we get some marketing guy who's out there, blah, 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 this will be great, this will be great. And you have to ask them, how do you know that? Do you have any data to back that up? Who told you this? Why is that true? Where's the evidence, man? And this is where all of this comes from, using epistemology. In an applied sort of way, uh, in the IT world that I uh, live in now. Because genuine stupidity is dangerous, right? People who think they know everything and actually go in and screw everything up, right? Maybe we can think of a few examples of that, not only in uh, our work world, but in the world of politics today. Right? They, they, they like to appear smart when they're actually being stupid, and they don't know that they're being stupid. Um, and and the, words, the, the worst thing about it is they can be very convincing, right? Oh, we think that if someone has a great deal of confidence, they must know what they're talking about. But in fact, it could be that the opposite is true. The people who are a little bit hesitant and are willing to say, oh, I'm not sure, might have a whole lot more information than the ones who are out there being the great leader. Right? So, stupid people demand that everyone else agrees with them. Smart people don't. Smart people are willing to accept and in fact will encourage disagreement and getting someone else's perspective on the matter. And yet, stupid people are often put in charge of projects. And part of this is the Peters principle, right? You, you work up to your level of incompetence and that's where you stay, where you're finally incompetent. But because they have the title of manager or project leader or vice president of whatever, uh, they, they put on a mask of competence, thinking that their face will eventually grow into that mask. But no, behind it, there's nothing but a bunch of blather and self-confidence, which is wrongly uh, directed because confidence and leadership are not the same thing. Not the same thing at all. Sometimes the best leaders are the ones saying, I don't know, what do you think? Rather than saying, I've got the answers, everyone follow me, off of the cliff. Um, lies. Everyone tells lies, right? The difference is uh, stupid people lie to protect themselves. Smart people only lie to protect others, right? Uh, so you can see this again in action. I don't think I have to give you too many examples because you've seen it in your own lives where a good person will say, no, no, you look great. Whereas the stupid person will be, hey, I look great. And you can see the difference there. There's a sort of narcissism to genuine stupidity as opposed to looking stupid. When you're looking stupid, you're not focused on yourself. You're not caring what you appear to be. You're caring about what you actually are. Whereas narcissists are all about putting on that big show so that they look smart. And again, this can be extremely dangerous. <coughs> a smart person asks a lot of dumb questions, whereas a dumb person pretends they don't even need to ask, right? You, you mentioned some, oh, we're gonna use microservices in our architecture. Oh yeah, I know all about that. 
well, I'm sorry, but nobody knows all about microservices, especially not how you've implemented it and which layers are going to be your priorities, right? They should be asking a bunch of questions about your microservices. So the same thing when it comes to answering questions. A smart person will try to answer your question in a simple, easy to understand way, focusing on who and why, right? Whereas a person who's only pretending to be smart is going to go right into all of the complicated details just to show off how smart they are, right? Not that anybody in any of your companies ever does that. No, no, of course not. Um, so a smart person is going to answer your questions openly and honestly and tell you when they don't know. A person who's only pretending to be smart is going to either refuse to answer, hide information from you, or use so much jargon, so many complicated technical terms that any reasonable person is going to be lost. And then they can chuckle to themselves, boy, I'm so smart because I made him feel stupid. <laughs> right? But the opposite is actually true. And Bertrand Russell, the philosopher, mathematician, uh, said something that I really liked, which is that a stupid man's report of what a clever man says can never be accurate. Uh, because they're going to translate it into something that they understand, not what it is you're actually trying to say. And again, this comes right back to that same thing of the person pretending to be smart, worried about how they appear, instead of genuinely asking and trying to learn, which is uncomfortable and makes you perhaps look dumb. So this idea of being stupid or looking stupid to be smart is nothing new. I haven't invented this. As you can see, this has been around for a very, very long time. Um, but what I have done is try to give you a practical step-by-step -step how to be stupid, right? Because there's some great benefits to uh, looking stupid while actually being smart. And now I'm going to show you how to do it because I'm an expert at looking stupid. So here's how I do it. We use the six W's. The six W's. Now, anybody who's ever had a journalism class has probably heard of the five W's. Well, yeah, those are the first five. But I've got a sixth one that really, really brings it all home. And this is how you can opt out of intellectual belly bumping. Instead of saying, oh, I know all about that, or, oh, aren't you talking about the mega flux capacitor? And, you know, jumping right into the jargon, step back, use these simple six questions, which all start with a W. And the first is who. Who. If you don't know who, all of the other questions are irrelevant. Okay? We only build systems for people. People are the only ones who have judgment. People are the only ones who can find or create value. Gold itself has zero value. It's that people agree that gold has value, that creates the value. Without people, you've got nothing. And so, anytime you want to learn about any subject, the first question should be, who? Who is using this? Who is benefiting from this? Who is paying for this? Who actually wants for this? Who is going to test it? Who is going to make it? If you don't know that first question, stop and find out, right? If you're trying to learn something, this should be the first question. Who is using this? Because that leads you to the next question, which is why. And again, with no who, it's not possible to have a why. 
So some people say, oh, you got to start with the why. I agree, but who comes first? With no who, there's no why. So why will this be valuable? Why would somebody use this? Why will somebody pay for it? What is the benefit? What is the motivation? And if you can't answer that question, stop doing what you're doing, right? There has to be an answer to that why. Why does this matter? Why does somebody find this valuable? Don't hide that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we need to ask these questions at the very beginning of the process. So if you're writing a user story, right, the, the typical format of the user story, uh, as a uh, I want to uh, so I can uh, right? So this is basically the who, what, why, right? And if you can't answer those questions, then stop doing it. And instead of saying, as a user, I would recommend create a real person or a persona representing that person and use their name, right? Instead of saying, as a user, how about as Bill, Bill, who we know is a 25-year-old software engineer whose goals in life are this and this, because then it's going to become clear who, instead of this anonymous, one-size-fits-all user, right? Avoid the word user if you can. Get specific, telling who, because then you can describe why. Why does Bill want to do this? Um, Next question is when, right? When is somebody going to use this? Is there something else that has to happen first? So if we uh, take the example of a hamburger, right? Who is going to eat the hamburger? Right, well then we can have some pretty clear ideas on, on a representative well, let's, let's take a teenage uh, kid called Honza. Honza is 15 years old. <laughs> Why is he going to eat the hamburger? Because he's hungry and it fills him up and it's relatively cheap. When is he going to eat the hamburger? Well, most likely it's only going to be lunch, dinner, or late at night. Probably not for breakfast, right? And this is helping you define that product, even for a simple example like this. So if you don't know when somebody's going to use your product, again, stop and keep on asking, when is someone going to use this again? Well, they're just going to use it. Uh, really? Well, can you tell me the time of day or the circumstance or the preconditions or the things that are going to have to be done before they can get into a position to using this? We were hearing earlier about some products that perhaps came before their time. And if they had asked the when question, maybe they could have avoided being too early to the market because they could have set this as a precondition for release is when there is sufficient critical mass of uh, potential uh, buyers of this particular thing. So actually consciously asking these really dumb questions, the dumbest questions you can possibly imagine, but they're going to inform your strategy. And if you look stupid, you might be able to become smart. Um, and you should also ask, when are people not going to use this? When I'm showing people how to uh, build products in an agile manner, I'll often ask them, okay, so you've got your user personas, and that seems pretty clear. You've got your buyer personas, okay. Can you give me an anti-persona? Who is it that we do not want to build this for? Right? Because if we try to please everybody, we're probably going to please nobody. So let's figure out who do we want to piss off? Who do we want to avoid using this? Who, who are the people we don't want as customers? 
right? Because there's probably some people you do not want to have as customers for your company. Define them. Where? Right? Again, this is a simple question that has profound impacts. Do you know where people are using your product? I mean, their physical environment. Are they, are they using your product on the mobile phone while riding the bus? Well, that's going to have design uh, implications. Are they using it at the office in front of a huge screen? Well, that gives you a whole bunch of different design options. Are they using it in a low bandwidth environment or someplace where it's saturated with bandwidth? Are they using it in a place where it's rock solid, they're always going to have the Wi-Fi? Or is it going to be a place where it's still reconnecting? <laughs> right? And asking these questions in advance gives you the kind of information you need so that you can inform your strategy, you can decide what you're going to build and be smart, even though you look stupid. Because people ask, well, well you know, they're going to use it anywhere. Well, come on, that's not realistic. Let's get specific. Where are they going to use this? Um, and where are they going to look for it? One of the worst parts of user interface design is, OK, they've got that feature somewhere. But it's not logically grouped or it's put in a creative place. We'll, we'll put our OK button at the top left instead of the bottom right. Nobody will expect that, right? But we should be asking, where would people reasonably be looking for this feature? Where should it group together logically, according to the perspective of the users, not according to the perspective of, well, I've only got so much space, so I'll jam it over here because that was free. Yeah. <clears throat> you also want to ask, where are we going to make this? Physically, are we going to be doing this in an open space office with hundreds of distractions? Or does our team actually get a dedicated room where we can all work together? Or are we going to have this distributed around the world where everybody's in a different time zone and we're only communicating via webcam and uh, Slack channels? Ask those questions. If you're going to be managing a project, if you're going to be investing in a project, ask, where are we going to make it? Just as you're going to ask, who is making this, and why are they making it? Because sometimes we forget that there's at least three kinds of uh, stakeholders involved in this. You've got the actors within your system, the users, the people actually clicking on buttons and swiping left and right. You've got the buyers. They might be the same as the actors, but oftentimes they're a different kind of person. And then third, and much more important than people realize and often forgotten, there's us. The people in this room. The creators. Why are we making this? Is it only for the money? Is it only to show off how smart we are? Or do we have a deeper, more important reason for doing what we are doing with our lives? Why are we creating this? Right? Because that's going to inform where you're going to make it and when you're going to make it. Knowing the answers to these simple questions. And where are you going to test it? Are you going to test it in a realistic environment under the same conditions as the people using your system? Or are you just going to have a crappy test server that's the discarded equipment that nobody else wants and that's what QA gets? All right? So you want to be thinking about all of these things in advance. And, and just having this simple list of six W's helps you to do this. This is how to be looking stupid. The least important question is what? Because it's also going to be the most obvious. And yet, think how many times your requirement specification, your user stories are all about the what. 
and they never answer who, why, when, and where. So what is the one question you could skip? Because that's going to become obvious when all the other questions are answered. But I would like to add to what questions that you might find valuable is, you know, what else is available? Because that might answer the question, do we really have to make this? Maybe someone else already made it. We don't have to copy whatever other people have done, right? There might be something else that's perfectly functional that is already working. Why are we doing this in the first place? What else is available? And then a really useful question, if you're ever interviewing somebody, if you're ever asking someone all of these questions, your final question should be, is there something I've forgotten to ask you, right? Because maybe there was something really important they wanted to tell you, but because it wasn't on your list of questions, you ran out of time for that. Give a little bit of extra time when you're, when you're learning about something and ask one of your experts, or the person who's answering your questions, what have I forgotten to ask you? All right, that can be extremely powerful and useful. And it also gives respect to show that even though you've got these great six W's, that won't necessarily cover everything. Be humble enough to say, is there something else I've forgotten? So there's the five W's. You guys have heard these before, right? From journalism, the famous five W's. So what weird thing could be the sixth? Aha. Uh -huh. <coughs> Ask what is weird. Is this just a standard implementation? Okay, then give me the reference to the, you know, standard description, and we're done. Cool. But is there something weird? Is this hamburger got avocado and mayonnaise and sriracha sauce on it? To make it weird? To make it interesting? To make it something new and valuable and unique? And if it's not weird, if there's nothing weird about this, if there's nothing difficult, unusual, innovative, weird, why are we doing it? If it's not weird, why is it interesting? Okay? So this might be the most important question. Asking what is weird about this thing we're going to do. So there's my six W's. And if you use these six W's, I can guarantee you that you will look stupid. <laughs> and become smart by asking these very simple questions. They're very powerful. Anybody can use it. Um, and from my own life, I am a great example of a very stupid man who has somehow managed to become successful simply because I'm not afraid of looking stupid. So looking stupid can make you smart. The six W's are powerful tools that anybody can use. If you've got kids at school, Teach them these six W's, okay? And teach them to ask their teachers these six W's. Huh? Maybe the teacher will think that your kid's a little smart ass. Well, do you really care? Anybody ever ask you what your grades are? what your grades were back in university? Nah, nobody cares. Nobody cares. What matters is what you're able to learn. And your kids can be using these questions. I know because mine uses them, and he makes me feel stupid every time. <laughs> He's a lot smarter than me. He's seven. <laughs> so use these questions to think for yourself, to be comfortable with looking stupid, because the answers can make you actually become smart. So I see that I, I still have five minutes here, so I'm going to, uh, th there's nobody to give me a giraffe and stop me from talking anymore. 
So uh, in lieu of a giraffe, uh, I'm going to ask uh, if you would like to ask questions or if you'd like to go to the open space and the lunch immediately. Yes, sir. A stupid question. Yes, sir. Yes, who? And you talked about people. But this planet is much more than just people. And do you think that because there are organizations that are not just for the people, even maybe some of them are following their interests, but the planet is much more than just people. And people made lots of harm for this planet. So why you suggest to ask focused question, not a holistic question? Okay, so if I understand you properly, uh, your question is, and, and thank you, that's a, that's, a, that's a great stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what you're asking is, uh, yeah, I, I say basically it all comes down to people, that's why you want to start with the who. And you're saying, well, wait a minute, Fred, there's uh, creatures and organizations that are not people what about them? Because after all, people have kind of screwed up this planet pretty good. So maybe we should also be thinking about the dolphins and the whales and the Gaia, the, the, the Earth as an entire system. Absolutely. And I say, yeah, you're right. Without them, we can't live. You're absolutely right. But I don't know how to ask them questions. I can't speak dolphin. <laughs> I mean, asking this question, sometimes we need to think about them, not only us and our, I don't know, wishes, because our sometimes egoistic wishes are leading for this planet to die. And this problem is growing for many, many years already. I'll agree with you, but uh, I'll, you know, to, to say that you're right, you know, uh, the, the planet is not only people. I mean, from one perspective, uh, you know, we're just a parasitic growth on the planet which is probably already overpopulating and heading for a crash like you would see in a bacteriological petri dish. Sure, but I still come back to, uh, as, a, as a practical sense, uh, even when we talk about these impacts on the Earth, it's still going to be relative to the human experience, simply because I don't speak dolphin, I don't speak chimpanzee, I don't speak uh, ant or bee. So that's all I can answer is when it comes to who, generally I mean people because they're the ones who can answer for us. Even if you are asking about the meta systems surrounding people, it's still going to be people who are giving you the answers. So interesting question, thank you. Uh, another question, yes, here. The disadvantages of... No, but um, perhaps you can ask the question, who has disadvantages of the new thing? Very good. You have Thank you. Yes, so, so she's, she's giving the suggestion that another way to use who to address your question is not only who benefits, but who is going to have a negative impact or a negative result from what we are doing, right? Because, you know, I could come up with this really cool way to make money, right? I get uh, feedthecat.com and savethemouse.com. And on one of them, you bet to give the mouse to the cat. And on the other one, you bet to save the mouse from the cat. And that would benefit me. I would get some money from it. But um, it would kind of be detrimental to the world as a whole, so maybe I shouldn't do that. And thinking about the broader who, it's not just us, right? We have to think about the, the broader ecosystem, environment, and civilization and cultures that we inhabit. So I, I have time for one more question, and then it's time for lunch. Uh, n not a question, but a uh, note, because uh, I really liked 
the idea that the answer to who uh, is not necessarily people, mm. but I think that that makes the question even more important because imagine, for example, medicine, right? You can swallow pills and then you ask, who is this for? And the answer would be horses. Mm -hmm. Get into trouble. So, yeah, you're right. They're, yeah. They're, you know, if you're talking about veterinary science, then the who would be the dogs, the cats, the horses, yeah. the sheep, the cows, the chickens. Sure. Sure. Okay. So, with that, I, I hear applause in the next room, which means it's time for lunch. A lot of big fans of lunch here in the room. <laughs>